Now the position of the candidates on the stage, the order of responding to questions, and the order of their two-minute closing statements were decided early. So now to the debate, and the first candidate to respond will be Jim Hines. And Jim, the question is, what specific combination of benefits reductions, such as a later retirement age and new or increased revenues, would you support to deal with long-term solvency problems projected for Social Security? Well, thank you, Kay, for that question, and let me get, begin by thanking the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this, the third debate uh, that Dan and I have had. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, core of our democracy, to hear two candidates who are seeking your vote, putting out different ideas and different visions uh, for the future of this country. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Uh, your question goes right to the heart of one of the most challenging issues that we as a country will face, which is the fact that we are in a very difficult fiscal situation. Uh, for a long time, we have been making promises through our budget, through our system of Social Security, through Medicare, to the people of America without setting aside the money to deliver on those promises. Uh, we have some tough work to do on our budget. Uh, we have, for the last 12 years now, been running deficits that have accumulated. Even more, we have very substantial promises, unfunded liabilities in the Medicare program and in the Social Security program uh, that we need to deal with. And it's worth noting that we shouldn't scare people on these issues. Our senior citizens rely on these two programs. They have come to be at the very heart of the security that we offer to our senior citizens. The promise in Social Security's case that when you retire, you will not retire into poverty. Uh, Social Security has about $8 trillion in unfunded liabilities. These are promises that have been made to everybody who's alive today that we have not reserved against. Medicare, incidentally, is much more challenging. It's about $40 trillion in unfunded liabilities. Those two things actually dwarf the size of the U.S. debt. And so you've asked a question that really gets to a real important fiscal issue. On Social Security, we have fixed this before. In 1983, a commission came together to adjust the four or five things that you can adjust to make Social Security permanently sustainable. Those things are fairly well known. You can change the retirement age. You can talk about means testing. You could, you've got a payroll withholding tax that is set at a certain size, and then you've got a cap on which wages are no longer withheld. Um, I think that we can come together, and I actually think that this is going to be easier to solve than the Medicare challenges, and probably at the end of the day easier to solve than some of our budget difficulties. Personally, I would favor looking at the retirement age. We have now, we now grow, we live a lot longer than we used to, but we need to do that carefully. Some of us put on ties to go to work, other people lift heavy objects or service firemen, and we need to be careful about how we think about that. Uh, and I also think it's worth looking at means testing in a limited way for Social Security. Uh, people who are very wealthy and have very high incomes might be asked to scale back on some sort of scaled basis uh, what their Social Security check is. Uh, we do need to come to the table with no preconditions and just say we're going to negotiate this. There is one thing that Dan and I actually agree with, which is that we will not privatize Social Security. Uh, this is a little bit of a difference that uh, uh, that we have, though, in terms of whether we're willing to look at private accounts. Uh, Dan has said that he, on the radio, he said that he would be willing to look at diverting some money into private accounts. Uh, I want people to have private accounts, save your money, but Social Security cannot be subject to the kind of risk that uh, we saw devastate accounts in the last uh, three or four years. Dan? Well, thank you, Kay. And again, thank you all for coming here today, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for organizing it. Uh, the beauty of our American democracy is every two years we get a choice. Uh, and the choice this year through this debate you'll see cannot be more clear. If folks are happy with how things are going in Washington, then Jim is a great choice. He's voted with Nancy Pelosi 94% of the time. But if you think there's a better way, basically free enterprise and small government, I think I've got better solutions. Now, of course, with the first question, you have one that actually, Jim and my answers are pretty similar is I actually first believe that Social Security, we can't scare seniors. It's solvent until 2037. But that's actually good news for us, because that means we only have to make moderate changes today to make it sustainable in the long run. Now, there are only two things that I would rule out, and as Jim said, I would rule out privatization. 
Uh, I would also rule out raising taxes. Uh, we cannot tax our way out of this problem. But as Jim also said, there are a lot of different ideas that are out there, none of which are going to involve slashing Social Security benefits. We don't need to do that. What we need is to do what they did in 1983. Republicans and Democrats on a commission headed by Alan Greenspan coming together to agree on those moderate changes. That's exactly what we need to do. And Jim did misquote me slightly as, I am for optional private accounts on top of Social Security. I actually believe the government should be promoting things like 401ks. And if we had something optional on top of it, I think that would be a great thing to do. But we can't divert Social Security money to those accounts. We actually need to make sure that Social Security is there, not just for current retirees, and it's not at risk for current retirees, but for our generation. We have to make sure that the promise that was made with Social Security continues to be kept. But make no mistake about it, with moderate changes in a bipartisan way, we can make Social Security permanently sustainable. I, yeah, I'd just like to address that very quickly. Um, you are going to hear some very substantial differences in vision uh, up here today. Uh, I'm a believer in continuing to move this country forward, to taking on honestly the difficult challenges that we face around energy policy so that we're generating jobs right here in Connecticut, around improving our system of education, and around protecting our families and our seniors. Uh, we owe it to our seniors and we can do an awful lot better as we have all witnessed in the last three to four years in protecting our families. I have been saying for some time, and listening to Dan for some time say that he's proposing moderate changes to our budget and to our entitlement programs. And I have looked at those changes in very sharp detail. And look, the budget is a complicated thing, but I will tell you this, the kind of slashes that Dan is proposing, and we all acknowledge that we need to make cuts, we're gonna have uncomfortable conversations about uh, our budget. The magnitude of the changes, and I've been saying this now in three debates, would necessarily gut Medicare and Social Security. Now Dan has accused me of using fear tactics I would urge you to take a look at the Hartford Current's endorsement of me as a candidate for this district, where they wrote, Dandy Masella is pushing for a federal spending cap that could decimate, their word, not mine, decimate Medicare and Social Security. Well, and of course, saying that the Hartford Current endorsed me is like saying the Democratic Party has endorsed me. <laughs> it's like the Democratic press release from Jim. The, the truth of the matter is, is what I've proposed is a federal spending cap to say that the government should be no more than 20% of GDP. Now under Bill Clinton, in his last year, it was 18% of GDP. Now we're at 26%. And that's largely the fault of a Democratic Congress that has built up $3 trillion of debt in the last 23 months. That is unsustainable. Now to get to 20%, we're going to have to make some hard choices. We're not going to have to gut Social Security. We're going to have to make the changes that we are talking about up here that we just both agreed on. You're also going to have to be smarter about defense spending. And as we draw down in Iraq and Afghanistan, to actually save that money and put it back to reduce the deficit. And we're going to need to reduce the number of federal employees and put their health care and pensions in line with the private sector. All tough choices but tough choices that this Congress has failed to make. When a Congress increases spending by 22%, which is what you voted for, and then they come back and they say, oh my gosh, well I really think we need to cut spending. I say, look at what politicians do, not what they say. So Jim, I do stand by going back to the level of spending that we had in the Clinton years. I think we had a very good government in the 1990s, and I think we can get back to that. Gentlemen, anything else specifically on Social Security? All right, next question. And then you're the first to respond. Uh, we have a couple of questions that relate to the, uh, the environment and um, what kinds of um, legislation you, you support in terms of protecting the environment. But it gets specific in terms of what your position is regarding the concept of cap and trade as part of an energy and environment strategy. Right, thank you, Kay. I, I oppose cap and trade as it's currently been written. Uh, it is actually an energy tax where the government would sell the right to pollute and cap that at a certain level. But then, of course, those companies it sells it to will actually 
flow through in the realm of higher energy prices for you. Estimates range from 10 to 20 percent. An energy tax is not the right way for us to have an energy policy. Our national energy policy needs to be the same as our national environmental policy, which is we need to get off of foreign oil. Now, how do you do that? There's no one single source of alternative energy that today can replace foreign oil. And the government can't pick winners. The government is not good at predicting the future. So what I've proposed is the government actually take, give large incentives both for research and deployment of alternative energy, but any alternative energy, whether that be natural, natural gas, solar, nuclear, wind, futuristic things like fuel cells, which aren't quite there yet, but we need more research on. All of these things will not only get us off of foreign oil, but will actually help our environment by reducing greenhouse gases. This is the national energy policy that we've been lacking for way too long. Dan, Dan has uh, launched a very significant ad campaign in which he is trying to wear the coat of crochets, because crochets was acknowledged to be a pretty moderate Republican. Uh, and you'll see the mailers and the, uh, and the television and whatnot. Um, on any number of issues, but on this one in particular, this table is not wide enough to put the distance that exists between Chris Shays and Dan DiBasella. This is true on, uh, uh, on women's rights issues. This is true on universal health care, which Chris Shays championed. Uh, nowhere is this more true than in the area of the environment and the energy area. Uh, Chris Shays was celebrated and lauded by the League of Conservation Voters as a lifetime hero on environmental issues. The same group, the League of Conservation Voters, will show you that Dan DiBasella has the single worst environmental record of any senator in the state of Connecticut in the last 10 years. The people in this room, your children, do not want Dan DiBasella in Washington working on energy policy. He has said recently that climate change is irrelevant. I believe that this is one of the most significant threats to the stability and security of this planet that we have seen in generations. Uh, he has just said that we need to push alternative energy, and he has told you that cap and trade would, ride, would raise energy costs. One of the other things that the Hartford Current in their endorsement of me said was that Mr. DeBasella has been troublingly loose with the facts. So let me offer you up some facts around the House Energy Bill, which had a cap and trade mechanism, which all sorts of groups recognized, by the way, including George H.W. Bush who put in place a cap and trade mechanism to reduce the amount of nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. An enormously successful program that worked. Now Dan wants to scare you and say it's going to raise your energy prices. Well, let's look at the facts. Two groups that agree on just about nothing. The National, the, uh, National uh, uh, Resources Defense Council, an environmental group, has done some study on this. The, the NRDC says that Connecticut's savings as a result of the House bill would have been $8.11 for every household per month under the House bill. The other group, which, which agrees with the NRDC on absolutely nothing, which is the American coal industry, also did a study of states and how they would fare. And their study shows that Connecticut would actually save an aggregate $26.2 million a year if we had passed the House bill that Dan opposes. So here you have somebody who has the endorsement of the League of Conservation Voters who wants to see Opal Solar up in Shelton go from employing 25 people on photovoltaics to employing 25,000 people on photovoltaics and is willing to vote that way relative to somebody who has the worst environmental record in the state of Connecticut in 10 years and says that climate change is irrelevant. Well, let's mark it down as 15 minutes as the first time Jim Lyons Jim has lied to you. And let me show you why. Jim Himes just claimed several times that I have the worst environmental voting record. Let's actually look at what the League of Conservation Voters has said. In 2010, I agreed with them 73% of the time. In 2009, I agreed 82% of the time. Now, there are a couple of facts about this. First off, Jim Himes thinks that you have to vote with somebody 94% of the time, like Nancy Pelosi, that's independent. Uh, Jim, true independence is voting on each and every bill based on its merits, which is what I did. And I agree with the environmentalists 70 to 80 percent of the time on things like greenhouse gases and the need to reduce them. I've disagreed on other things where there are actually bills that would actually kill jobs, such as prohibiting any development within 100 feet of a river. Now, 80 
71%, I'll let you judge if you think that's the worst record. I'll also let you judge if you think that's independent. But finally, I actually want to give these to you, and I'll make copies available to anybody who wants. There's actually three Democratic senators, Senator Hanley, Hartley, and Maynard, who all have lower scores than them. And if you'd like, I can give you 2009 and 2008, 2007. So, Mr. Himes, you're running TV commercials saying, I like the oil companies and I have the worst environmental record. Uh, I think the facts speak for themselves, Jim. And I think you can't say anything you want to desperately hold on to that. Dan, um, you've accused me of lying. Um, and what I said exactly was that over the course of the last 10 years, you have the worst environmental record of any state senator in Connecticut. That's exactly what I said. And you accused me of lying. Do you, do, you, do you say that it is inaccurate that you have the worst environmental record in the Senate over the last 10 years? I, I've only been in the Senate for four years, first off. Joe Jerry, I don't know if you're adding zeros into the other ones. Anyone who liked you from the president, to be honest, I will give you the numbers. You can do the math yourself. Is there are a number of senators who have voted with lower records than I have? And Jim, when you agree 73% and 82% of the time with the environmental lobby to say I'm the worst senator on the environment, Jim, you're just saying anything to get reelected. Yeah. You, over the course of your career, have accumulated the single worst record. And we'll invite the press to check that out. Absolutely. So they'll, they'll do their work. But you also accuse me of not being independent. I have taken some strong stands against my party. And you trot out this 94% number. The truth is that John Boehner, the chief of the Republicans in the Congress, votes with Nancy Pelosi the majority of the time because we vote on a lot of sports teams and whatnot. But Dan, you vote with your party on Capitol Hill in Hartford 98% of the time. So if you want to play that game, I'm happy to play it with you. And that 2% of the time that you don't vote with your party, it's because you're one of two Republican senators voting against the other Republicans when time comes to pass a clean contracting bill in the wake of the Roland administration because you're one of a handful of senators who voted against people required being required to report a firearm that has been stolen. So you get 98% to my 94%, but I can name specific policy areas where I've broken with my party and you break with your party to go to the far to the extreme. Well, and, and I do need to respond to that because yes, that's the question. Can I just say, yes, the, the original that's question was the environment. If you have one other comment and then we'll move on to another question. That's why. I would encourage you to check that statistic as well. It is also inaccurate. And ladies and gentlemen, I made a request before the debate started. Some of you may not have heard it, but I would just like to remind you that um, all cameras and recording devices in the audience do need to be turned off. And you should also be aware that the candidates have agreed that no part of the program may be used without written permission of the League of Women Voters. So I would just ask your cooperation in that. Thank you. All right, the next question, and Jim Himes is the first to respond. Would you support a law requiring disclosure of donors by, quote, independent, unquote, committees and groups that advertise for or against candidates for election? I absolutely would support such a law. Um, I think of uh, the long list of tough things that this country has seen in the last couple of years, the Supreme Court decision around Citizens United was a huge step backward for this country. I'm very proud to be a co-sponsor with Congressman John Larson of a bill that would introduce public financing for congressional and senatorial elections. Uh, we will have policy disagreements, as you see. We should agree, and everybody in this room should agree, that it is your vote and your vote and your vote that should decide whether Dan DiBasella or I represent you in Washington. We are now in a world where we've taken a huge step backwards, where corporations and unions, this is not a partisan issue, can spend in an unlimited way to attack uh, members of Congress. We're now seeing that hundreds of millions of dollars being spent by shadowy groups like Karl Rove's Crossroads for America and uh, the American Action Network, which right now is spending almost a million dollars saying that Chris Murphy voted to provide uh, Viagra to sex offenders in the health care reform bill, not just a, 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 a torpedo at the heart of our democracy, but spreading outright lies. So we need to take big steps in this country to remove the money from the system. 
frankly, what we have to do, which is to spend an awful lot of time calling up individuals and asking for money, is bad enough. It's a waste of time. Uh, nobody likes to be asked for that kind of money, and of course, it, sh it, it, it slants the system away from one vote, one person. This is something that we very much need to fix. It's tough. The Supreme Court has ruled. I voted for the Disclose Act, which would have required uh, CEOs and others who are spending out there to at least say, I'm doing this ad, to talk to their shareholders about it, to forbid foreign money from coming in to these outrageous pools of secret money. It passed the House. It has not gotten through the Senate because several Republican senators have decided to not let it through the Senate. And so Jim and I actually do agree on the problem, but I think we have different solutions. Is you know, any time that you have swift vote for truth or anything like that, where there's no transparency of where the money's coming from, that's wrong. You should know where the money's coming from, where donations are coming out. You know, and, and if people want to spend their money, God bless them, but you should know who's spending money on politics. And that's why one of the great things about our system is that in you know, most areas you do. You know, in our current election, you can go on to FEC.gov and see where Jim and I have gotten our money from ads. I've gotten 98% of my money from individuals, 82% of whom live here in Fairfield County. Uh, Jim has gotten half of his money from special interest groups. The number one and number two being Big Labor and Wall Street. So you can see that online. You can go on yourself and verify it. Uh, it's all right there. That's the way it should be for everything. And, you know, there are groups, the group that's running an ad against Chris Murphy, and, and, you know, they tried to run against Jim as well, and he quite properly stopped it, is because we shouldn't have anonymous ads attacking him or me or anybody else. And, and Jim doesn't need it. He does a great job attacking me all on his own. He doesn't need a third party coming in and doing it. And, you know, as long as you know the people, where the money's coming from, then I think that transparency is what we need. What we don't need, and what I disagree on, is spending your tax debt payer dollars on our attack ads. Do you know that Dan Malloy got six million dollars of your money to run all the negative ads he has on TV? Every Republican and Democrat, state representative and state senator candidate is using your tax dollars. That's not what we want to replicate in Washington. I don't want your money funding my political ads. And that's just the difference we have on this. Dan, if you're going to climb into the mud pit, we both agree that it's a mud pit. Don't try to stand up and say you're a little cleaner. Is it true that you got thousands of dollars from Exxon Mobil? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 2% of my money from special interests. And Jim, you take hundreds of thousands of dollars from Big Blue and hundreds of thousands of dollars from Wall Street. It is hypocritical for you to can't say you got one donation and all of a sudden we say, oh my God, Dan, you're so wrong. Will you return the one million dollars in PAC money that you have received if you're so hypocritical of this? Excuse me, just if you, if you be Jim, again. Excuse me, just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, please. We all want to hear what they each have to say. Please refrain from your applause and uh, any other expression so that we can use this time to hear their debate on the issues. Please, thank you very much. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't well, know. Well, we, 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 we both look. We both agree this is a dirty system. I just object to. Uh, I, I just object to uh, trying to be cleaner when when you're not. This is this is what happens in our system. When you're an incumbent, this was true of Chris Shays when I ran against him. When you're an incumbent, the pack's with you. When you're a challenger, you're not. So I guess the question is, Dan, are you going to set the standard and say if you win this election? Will you and your next election fight for re-election and agree not to take PAC money? An artful dodge, Jim. You didn't answer my question. Will you return the one million dollars that you have received? I'll answer your question if you answer mine. Well, then you have spent that money, so it's sort of an academic question. <laughs> Mistake of medicine. It treats the symptom, but not the disease. 
The symptom is that we have uninsured folks in this country that we need to cover. But the disease is that costs are out of control. And so what did this bill do? It increases costs on the 94% of us with insurance to cover the other 6%. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. And you can see the impact here in Connecticut. Aetna just announced for new policies, the cost is going up 50% because of this health care bill. That's the wrong thing. Instead, we need to lower costs for everybody. How do you do that? Well, there's no magic bullet. But there's about a dozen ideas out there that, when taken together, can lower the cost of health care by 10 to 20 percent, which will save everybody in the middle class money and give us more money to give vouchers to the insured to buy health insurance. So what are those ideas? They're things like tort reform, interstate competition between health insurance, incentives for preventative medicine, low-cost, high-deductible plans for young people who make up over a third of the uninsured, or things that nobody talks about. Like we spend $150 billion, with a B, dollars every year in this country on people who go into the hospital. They get sick, so they have to go back into the hospital. We're talking about doctors not properly washing their hands. These are things that can actually lower the cost of health care for all of us. Now, as in any 2,000-page bill, there are a couple good ideas in there. You know, things like no denials for pre-existing conditions, allowing uh, kids to stay on their parents' health care until they're 26. Good ideas, ideas we should keep. Of course, those are all the good ideas that went into effect now, where of course the trillion dollar plan that's gonna drive up our deficit doesn't start till 2013. So I would repeal that part of the plan and actually replace it with our plan to lower costs for the middle class and cover more of the uninsured. We need to remember that when Dan says it raises costs for 94% of us and uh, to benefit 6% of us. We need to remember that anybody in this room could easily be in that 6%. You lose your job, as millions of Americans have, you lose your health insurance. And so you wind up like Betty Berger, who was in my office in Washington a month and a half ago, who between jobs had her son be diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So she had to pay for his treatment, and she did. Made her homeless. She's 57 years old and is now sleeping on her friend's couch. Her son, by the grace of God, was cured. She's homeless after working her lifetime in central Connecticut because of the nature of the system. Thousands of people die in America because they don't have access to the system. The cost increases, which Dan is blaming on the health care reform bill, utterly inaccurately, by the way, of course, have been with us for, for decades, 15% a year on average. So the health care reform that we did took some very important and positive steps. It uh, provided a mechanism of coverage for tens of millions of Americans, so Betty Berger is not sleeping on a sofa at age 57. It made the insurance industry a better thing for all of us. No turning away kids with pre-existing conditions. No lifetime caps on coverage, so that when you get diagnosed with leukemia, you find that, sorry, you're out of money, it's on you, or you die. Uh, allowing 26-year-olds, 25-year-olds, anybody under 26, to go on their parents' insurance plan, something that I bet there are people in this room it's not free, but it's good stuff. And uh, the third piece of this, of course, was to take some initiatives to try to reduce costs in the system, something we both agree must be done. Dan says that this bill actually raised costs and that it adds to the deficit. That's exactly wrong. You can look up the CBO numbers and you will see that the CBO, nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, says that the bill over 10 and 20 years will reduce the deficit. It also incorporates just about every idea that has been tried on how to reduce costs. It's not going to reduce them today. If I went to Dan DiBasella, who's an insurance company executive, and said, you need to fix the Hartford Insurance's cost structure right now, he would say to me, are you crazy? He would say, try some pilots. Let's figure out. Let's see what other people have done to reduce costs. Let's try 12 things. And over time, we'll reduce costs at the Hartford, which, of course, is exactly what this bill has done. Things like accountable care organizations where doctors will work together around a patient rather than not sharing data. Things like bundling, where instead of a hospital when I got my appendix, the appendix taken out seven years ago, the hospital was paid for every knife they use, every pill they subscribe, everything they do. Now we're going to say you're going to get, just to make the number, 25000 Now they have an incentive to be efficient. All of those things are in there to be tried. Dan said something that was, of all the outrageous things he said tonight, the most outrageous. 50% increased in costs this year because of health insurance reform. Checkable fact. 
the insurance companies of Connecticut have said that the measures that we did, no lifetime caps, no turning away kids in pre-existing conditions, would add less than 2% to premiums. Checkable fact. 50% is just an outrage. These are insurance companies that last year had their single most profitable year ever. Top five insurance companies, $12.2 billion in profits. That's up 56% from the previous year. Dan wants to repeal this plan. I've been very honest with my constituents that it's not perfect, but it's a historic step forward. Let's, in the decades that come, make it better. Find what works and make it better so that we all have security, comfort, and a more efficient system. And I'm going to have two responses to that. Obviously, this is a big difference between you and myself. Uh, but one is, you know, we said, let's do some pilot programs to lower costs. We know how to lower costs. It's been done. It's not only been done in other countries that have tried some of these things, but here in our own country, at places like the Cleveland Clinic, where they've actually implemented some of the ideas that I'm talking about and seen actual cost reductions. So we don't need to pilot, you see, Jim's like, we need to pilot cost reduction. We don't need to pilot a trillion dollar health care plan that the government's going to run. I, I, I think that's a huge dichotomy. He thinks that this plan that's going to set up health care exchanges with mandates from the government is a better way than doing the actual cost reduction that we need to do and we need to do now. Now the second thing that Jim said, which is, it's interesting, you know, there's always, there's uh, statistics, damn statistics and lies. This one's a damn statistic, right? As he says, well, the, the health care bill, CPO says the health care bill is going to lower the deficit. And it does say that over, over 10 years. You have to look at the assumptions under that. First, is we have massive new tax increases starting January 1st, whereas the first costs don't come until 2014. So you have three years of taxes. That's what we're going to pay here in Fairfield County. Increases in the Medicare tax. Increases in the real estate taxes. Things that are actually going to enable this to be budget neutral that you'll pay for three years before anyone sees a benefit. Secondly, it relies on $500 billion will be dollars in Medicare. Now, how do they say we're going to find $500 billion in Medicare cuts? Well, they said there's fraud in the system. Well, there is fraud, but not $500 billion of it. So what they have done is they've slashed Medicare to pay for this new program. What's the effect of that? Well, I've talked to a lot of doctors who said that the Medicare reimbursement rates are going to be so low now that they either are not going to take new Medicare patients or they're going to hike up their rates on everybody with private insurance to cover it. So what you've done by doing this, Jim, you people, you say, well, how's this gonna drive up costs? That's how it's doing it. Through the Medicare cuts, doctors are gonna get less money, so they have to raise the rates on the rest of us. And so this bill, you know, even though, you know, pay credit where credit's due, it is gonna cover an additional 6% of the population. It's gonna hurt the other 94% of us to do it. And I just think there's a better way doing the cost reduction ideas that we know work. You know, it's worth spending a little bit more time on this. And, um, you know, Dan said something very interesting. Before anyone sees a benefit, I'm willing to bet that there's a senior citizen in this room right now who uh, is now getting taken out of the donut hole. The donut hole was that moment in time when seniors were, were forced to cover every dollar of their drug expenses. Now we have begun to close that. Seniors are seeing $250 checks. We'll soon see a 50% discount on their drugs when they fall into that situation. It was forcing a lot of them to choose between rent and drugs or forcing them to cut pills in half. There are people in this room who no longer will be subject to annual and uh, lifetime caps on their health insurance. I bet there are people in this room who have a 24 year old who just got out of school and can't find a job. So the idea that people are not benefiting now, Dan, is just inaccurate. And your charge on Medicare, we've heard this in a couple of debates just an outrage, slashing $500 million. Everybody knows that Medicare is subject to very substantial fraud and abuse, and we're going after that, and we're going to find it. But what Dan is not telling you is that the $150 billion of the $500 billion that are saving to Medicare are your taxpayer dollars that we are no longer sending to private insurance companies as subsidies, as subsidies to run Medicare Advantage programs. This was an idea of the Bush administration. Let's have private companies in competing with traditional Medicare programs, because private sector is more efficient. It happens to be true in some things, but not in health insurance. And 
will pay them subsidies to encourage them into the system, and then those subsidies will go away. The funny thing about subsidies, they have a way of not going away. So we're taking away your taxpayer dollars that are going to the Medicare Advantage programs without in any way damaging care. Now, I want to close with this point. Dan and I have disagreements on policy and on facts. I'm pretty comfortable that when the facts are checked, it's not going to be a good day for him. But let's look at third parties who looked at this. Let's look at the organization that is sponsoring today's debate, which wrote to each and every member of Congress and Senate and said, get this done. The letter dated March 18th from the League of Women Voters reads, Finally, passing comprehensive health care reform will represent an important, indeed an historic step forward, leaving the current system in place after both the House and Senate have worked so long and come this far would be a travesty. The sponsor of our first debate, the AARP, which is the watchdog for Medicare and Social Security, aggressively promoted, supported, and advocated for this health care reform. Dan knows a doctor. The American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians, advocated and endorsed this health care reform. Well, and I think there you have it, folks. Is, you know, Jim and I do have a difference on this, and I think we agree on what our difference is, is if you like this health care bill. If you think, as he said, the government does a better job with this than the private sector, then Jim's your guy. If you think that there's a better way to actually lower costs in the system for all of us and cover the uninsured, I think I have a better plan. And you can vote for the guy who you think you agree with. All right, next question. Uh, Jim, you're the first to respond. Simply put, you both state that you are pro-choice. What does being pro-choice mean specifically to each of you? I grew up um, in a household with uh, a single mom, I'm to honest today, uh, and two sisters. I now live in a household with a wife and two daughters, uh, and I've seen up close and personal the challenges that women face across the board on issues of their right to control their own bodies, on health insurance issues, on issues like the fact that women are still paid 79 cents for every dollar that a man is paid for doing exactly the same work. I've watched friends and family members struggle with the decision about whether to terminate pregnancy. This is a decision that is consequential beyond description. It draws on values and faith and who we want to be and should be made by the woman in question to draw on those values and not by white guys in suits in Capitol Hill or Hartford. And so I am abide by the rules. Uh, I have been endorsed, like Chris Shays before me, like Chris Shays before me, I have been involved and endorsed by Planned Parenthood and by NARA. Andy Vasella, who again is trying to wear the Chris Shays coat, has not. Andy Vasella was endorsed in 2008 by the Family Institute of Connecticut. I urge you to look into what these people are all about. They led the charge on marriage, against marriage equality in the state of Connecticut and are deeply anti-women. Andy Vasella was one of three senators to vote against requiring emergency rooms to carry contraception for rape victims. He says he did it for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, of course, has no doctrine requiring uh, women to carry the baby of their rapist. What's even more troubling, this issue is complicated, what's even more troubling, because the policy is the policy, and the heart is the heart. Dandy Bissell, in explaining that vote to the Stratford Chamber of Commerce, said this, all I did when I voted on the rape bill was not required that they provide emergency contraception to women. All I did. That is a huge difference between the two people sitting in front of me today. Well, Jim is trying to create a false difference here. He knows that people don't agree with him on the economy and the deficit in health care. So he's trying to scare women. He's trying to scare women into believing, I will take away the rights that are constitutionally yours. I am pro-choice. I believe every woman has the right to do with her body as she pleases, period. And Jim and I have the exact same opinion on that. Now, Jim and I differ on this vote that he's mentioning, which he wants to lead you to believe that I want to deny emergency contraception to rape victims. My God, what a monster. This is what Jim is trying to portray me as, as if anybody would want to deny emergency contraception to rape victims. I believe in every woman has the right to emergency contraception. And it should be freely available over the counter to everyone. 
What I don't believe in is forcing Catholic hospitals to do something against their beliefs. I'm pro-choice, but I would never force any Catholic doctor to perform an abortion. Similarly, everyone has the right to emergency contraception, but I'm not going to force Catholic hospitals to give it out in violation of their beliefs. Now, the Catholic Church reached a independent negotiated settlement with this after the vote, and good for them. But I don't want government telling women what they should do with their bodies, and I don't want any government telling any religion what they need to do. And Jim, if that's the difference between you and me, then so be it. Um, before, uh, apparently some people are, are some of you having difficulty hearing the two candidates? Yeah. Yeah. I might I ask my gentleman Ruth to see if he can up the bottom. Thank you. All right, um, Dan, you're the first to answer this next question. Two questions that, that relate to Afghanistan and something related to it. Uh, the question is, under what circumstances do you envision the Afghanistan war or the U.S. role in it being brought to a close? And a corollary to that, what do you think of the possibility of reinstituting the draft? Well, so the second one first is easy, as I'm against reinstituting the draft. Uh, as to the first one, in terms of Afghanistan, this is an area where, up till now, I think that the president has gotten it largely right, but I worry that we are now overstaying our wealth. So uh, I believe that the president was right to send more troops to be the troop surge. If we were going to be there and get the mission done, we should get it done right. Now, what was that mission? Two things. First, to ensure that there's no al-Qaeda left in Afghanistan, because that's where they used their base of operations on their attack on us. And second, that the Taliban was so weakened that they cannot come back to power once we leave. From everything I have seen, we have achieved both of those missions. What the mission should not be is nation building. We're not going to turn Afghanistan into a capitalist democracy overnight. That's not going to happen. So now that I believe we've achieved both of those uh, objectives, we should begin drawing down troops in Afghanistan, much the same way we've done in Iraq. Slowly, steadily, so we don't cause instability, but we bring our men and women home. And my worry is that we are fighting the last war in Afghanistan that Al-Qaeda is actually reforming in different places around the world. In failed states like Yemen and Somalia, where there's barely any government, and in places like Pakistan, where there is still a significant amount of Al-Qaeda. We need to be focusing our efforts there, because Al-Qaeda is a patient enemy. They attacked us in 1993 at the World Trade Center and waited eight years to attack us again. They are planning right now on figuring out how to get a dirty bomb and how to explode it into New York City. So we can't keep fighting the last war. Going forward, the war on terror means disrupting Al-Qaeda wherever they are. I, I don't, at this point, support a, a draft either, um, though I wouldn't dismiss it quite so quickly because you, you have to at least be intrigued by the notion that maybe, 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 if my colleagues in the House and senators on the other side of the Capitol had their sons and daughters in the military, their nieces and nephews, maybe we wouldn't rush into so it's not something that I think the American population is, is, uh, is ready for. But what if, what if all of us had a stake in the hugely consequential decisions we make about whether we're going to go into or not? On Afghanistan, I disagree with Dan on this point, and I've spent a lot of time on this as a member of the Committee on Homeland Security, on something that's deeply personal to me, because I was in Lower Manhattan on 9-11, and I saw, as all of us did, up close and personal, uh, the devastation and the horror of terrorism. Uh, I think this president made a mistake in deciding to pursue what is essentially a nation-building strategy. It's called counterinsurgency. It's very mathematical. You put a certain number of troops on the ground to hold down the population. They can be our troops, foreign troops, and of course, Afghan military. But as I learned when I was in Afghanistan uh, nine, ten months ago, uh, we don't have a partner there in the form of President Karzai. His brother, Wali Hamid Karzai, is a drug lord in Kandahar. Uh, this is a very complicated and primitive society where our incredible young men and women in uniform and our people in USAID don't really know what's going on. I think that the right answer was always what was promoted at the time by Vice President Biden, which is let's have just enough presence to go after the terrorists, which by the way are not in Afghanistan right now. 
General McChrystal at the time put the number of Al-Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan and still uh, roughly 50 or 60 there in Pakistan where we are having actually a very devastating effect on them with a variety of programs. So we are in fact nation building in Afghanistan right now and as a member of Congress I will not vote to expand that mission. Apart from the fact that July and August were the most deadly months for U.S. troops in Afghanistan that we've seen in the last nine years there, we are spending now $120 million on the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I look at 95, I look at the merits, I look at Central High School in Bridgeport whose roof is falling down, and I say we can use that money to nation build right here. And, and this is, I don't think Jim and I are disagreeing on this. We, we can't nation build. I support a slow drawdown, and I don't think Jim would support us just pulling out either. Uh, it needs to be measured. I think we've done a good job in Iraq of slowly drawing down there. We need to do the same in Afghanistan. And this is a difference between Jim and I is I wouldn't spend the money. I would use it to reduce the deficit. Well, I don't, I'm not going to accept that that's a difference. I, um, we have serious issues to address on the deficit, on Social Security and Medicare. We have serious differences, by the way, about what we would choose right now, given the choice between spurring employment and reducing the deficit. Both are serious issues, but we see those differently. But there is no getting around the fact, and you need to think about this as you look at the uh, incredible cuts that Dan has proposed. I'm not saying we don't need to do cuts, but the incredible cuts that Dan has proposed. There is no getting around the trillions of dollars that over the next several decades we will need to invest in our infrastructure, in our roads, in our airports, in the FAA. This is not spending. This is investment. And you know what? Our forefathers did this in the 1950s when they built the interstate highway system. We are going to need to invest in that and in our schools. So the answer is cut where we can and invest where we must if we are to maintain prosperity. All right, I just call the two of you attention to the time to be uh, expended. All right, it's uh, Jim's turn to be turn to be first to respond to this question. Given our, at least according to this questioner, our dangerous dependence on foreign oil and the peril it poses to our democracy, what will you do in Congress to ensure that the federal government helps shift us to cleaner, renewable forms of energy? After all, this is a national security issue. This is absolutely a national security issue. It is an outrage that we continue to send billions of dollars to Saudi Arabia, Venezuela. I was in Afghanistan. I saw where those dollars were from Saudi Arabia. It's also a jobs issue. Uh, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, said that the wealth that gets created and the jobs that get created in the new energy revolution will make the IT revolution, something that he knows a little bit about, pale in comparison. And yes, it's an environmental issue. Climate change is a serious challenge for this generation to address. Anyone in this room with kids had better hope that we're thinking hard about that issue. Uh, I have already, in the last, in my first term, in the last two years, legislated hard on this issue. I have, working with my fellow congressmen, uh, put in place legislation in the House that would incentivize green building, because about 40% of the energy we use is in structures like this one, and we know how to change that. We're doing it all over the country, and the government should help through tax incentives, through telling people how to do it, you know, learning what works in one place, in one school, and making sure that all schools know how you make a more efficient school. And again, helping uh, private sector companies. The way the government worked to uh, help develop the internet. This was a DARPA project developed by the defense agencies that created huge wealth, I don't need to tell you, in the internet arena. Um, I mentioned Opal Solar. Why are they only employing 25 people? They want 25,000. GE. 6,000 employees here in Fairfield County, one of the world's largest manufacturers of wind turbines. When we continue to really address this seriously, as we did in the bill that I supported in the House, that Dan DiBusello opposed, or through mechanisms like Hartford tried to pass in an energy bill that Dan voted against, which had good stuff for clean energy in it, only when we do that and get away from this drill baby drill mentality are we going to address national security create jobs right here and get serious about climate change. Well, so, you know, this is interesting. The, the, the bill that Jim's referring to, cap and trade, actually does not have the kind of incentives we need to actually get real alternative energy here in this country. 
It's an energy tax. It's going to increase cost for all of us. The bill he refers to in Hartford was a 132 section bill that essentially re-regulated the electric industry and would increase cost for all of you. It had one really good section in it about solar energy. And as you know, sometimes you have one good section in a bill that's really, really long. And for those of us who actually read the bills, you go through it and you actually can say which sections are good and bad and make the determination for the bill. Now, what we need to do is what I said before, is not pick winners, right? The problem with the approach that cap and trade in the sections he did address on technology is it picks winners. Jim says he likes solar power. He's a commercial law touting solar power. Solar power is great, but government's not very good at picking winners. I can't sit here and tell you if it's solar, if it's wind, if it's nuclear, if it is the next generation fuel cells, if it's gas shale, which is a new, uh, a new way to actually get gas out of rock. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. What I do know is that government shouldn't pick winners. Instead, we should give broad tax credits for two things. First is research, because a lot of these technologies aren't there yet. If they were, the market would have adopted them. So we do need more research, and government can incent that. But the other is deployment, to actually make it easier for alternative energy to actually happen, to get regulation out of the way, and to actually put in place tax credits for folks who want to adopt these things. So rather than picking winners, if we take a broad-based approach, we can get off for a Because any one of these answers, solar, wind, any one of these, can't replace oil at this point. And anybody who says it can, isn't telling you the truth. So we need to incent everything. So Dan, just two, two quick things. I, uh, I talked about what both the coal industry and what the uh, NRDC said about what would happen in the state of Connecticut under the House bill. And since we're passing papers back and forth, I'm going to hand it to you. Um, but you said picking winners. Look, I generally agree with that. But I gave an example of an instance where the government uh, started some research, committed to uh, substantial dollars to research, and led to massive wealth. And you're saying don't pick winners. I talked about the internet and the way that DARPA developed that, leading to you know trillions of dollars in wealth today. Would you have had the government not pick the internet as a possible wealth generation area? Well, I mean, Al Gore did create the internet, <laughs> so I think it was obviously him and government that made it happen, not the hundreds of internet companies out there who actually people are using today. So if you're asking me, should government pick winners in energy? No, it should not. Well, I, I appreciate the humor on Al Gore, but everybody in this room knows that DARPA developed the internet, the government. Al Gore tried to take credit. This is, I guess, what politicians do. But I asked you a specific question. Would you have not had us invest the money that DARPA used to develop the internet that allowed the hundreds of internet companies to do what they did. Jim, I, I'm quite honestly, I'll admit when my knowledge hits a barrier, I don't know how much we invested in DARPA or how we invested it. I don't think, though, that the government is responsible for the internet. I actually believe that it has been private enterprise and the hundreds of internet companies that are out there right now that have made the internet what it is today. And this is a difference between us. You think the government creates things like jobs. I think it's the private sector. And that's okay. We have a difference of opinion on that. But I, I can't claim to know the intricacies of the DARPA program. And I, I apologize that I don't. Dan, you All know, right, it's, just, it's just not, it's just, just, just to point point out that bad, right? Oh, is there a time imbalance? Yeah, um, we're getting. It's not either or, Dan. It's not either the private sector or the government. And I, I dwell on the internet because that was an example of the government doing some significant basic research that created huge wealth. The same is true in the development of radar, on the development of nuclear energy, on the development of computers. It's not either or. It can be a partnership in some instances. Yes, John, we're just pointing out that uh, Dan, you view somewhat less time, so you have something to add. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan, you're the first to answer the next question. And I have a couple of questions that relate to Wall Street reform as well as banking regulation. So I guess to combine the two, uh, your views on new banking regulations, uh, those that have been passed or may need to be passed, as well as Wall Street reform generally So the, the regulation that was just passed, which Jim did have a, a very large hand in being on the Financial Services Committee, is what I would call a tale of the good, the bad, and the ugly. As most bills do, there were some good parts to it. Uh, putting derivatives on exchanges so that they were actually uh, be clear to folks. 
uh, actually requiring banks to hold on to a piece of mortgage-backed securities that they put together rather than be able to sell off all the risk. Good, smart, common sense ideas. The bad is that it's created seven new commissions that are accountable to no one who are authorized to essentially rewrite banking regulation in this country for credit cards, for loans, you name it, headed by folks like Elizabeth Warren, who are accountable to no one. Now, I actually think that Congress could have given a lot more specifics as to what the rules in the banking industry should be. Because what's been the effect? I don't know if anyone's tried to get a mortgage or anyone has a small business who tries to get a loan, but banks aren't lending. And if you ask them why, they'll tell you, well, I can do two things with my money. I can either borrow from the government and the Federal Reserve at 0% and invest it in a treasury bond at 2.5%, or I can give out a loan with a spread of 3 to 4%. And if I give out that loan, then the government is going to require me to submit a form every month on that mortgage or on that small business. And I don't really know what the rules are yet, because no one's written them. So the bill that they passed, the bad part about it, is that it's created the continuous uncertainty which has led to banks not lending out money. Now the ugly part is that they failed to address the root cause of the housing crisis. The root cause of the housing crisis was that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, two quasi-government entities, basically are allowed to back any loan they want with the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So if you're giving out a loan to someone with a low credit score, give them a reverse amortization mortgage, no problem, Uncle Sam's got your back. So what did the banks do? They gave out loans to everybody, knowing that there was no risk to them. And mortgage brokers started acting unethically, because you know what, there was no risk to them. This Congress made no changes to those. So the problem that happened, which we all admit, was a huge problem. It was way, way under-regulated in terms of what Freddie and Fannie were doing. It's still there. So this financial regulation, you know, there were some good parts to it, but more so it is creating uncertainty and failed to address the root cause. It will be news to the uh, former employees of Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, Merrill Lynch, and others that there was no risk to them. Uh, of course there was risk to them. Uh, the Wall Street reform which passed did three important things. Uh, first, it for the, for, for, for the first time got consumer protection in one place. Previously we've had seven or eight agencies, all of which had a little bit of consumer protection. Now it lives at the Federal Reserve. Uh, Dan has a problem with Elizabeth Warren, but it is in one place and it will be accountable to Congress. We don't let companies sell you toasters that will burn your house down. Now we will not allow companies to sell mortgages that they know a family can't possibly repay. Credit card companies, these hidden fees and whatnot, will be scaled back somewhat as a result of good consumer finance regulation. Dan mentioned derivatives being drawn into the light of day, something I was very closely involved in in the Congress and very, very important. And lastly, uh, we took steps to do away with the possibility that we will ever see a bailout again. Systemically important institutions Stern, Lehman Brothers, AIG, will now be subject to much more intense oversight and scrutiny, higher capital requirements, and importantly, this gets a little technical, when they're on their backs, the government will step in and resolve them, take them apart in a priority fashion, just the way the FDIC has been doing for 70 years with banks. Dan has some wacky ideas on this point. Um, he uh, has said that, first of all, we created seven new commissions, which is not true. In fact, we eliminated one of the regulators. We had the spaghetti of regulators, SEC, FDIC, OCC. We eliminated the OTS, brought it a little bit more uh, simpler. Secondly, he has said that we, we delegate to the regulators the right to write the rules. You've heard him complain about that. We've been doing that since the 1930s, and when we created the SEC and these other entities, and as a member of Congress with an above average command in this industry, I promise you, you do not want my colleagues writing specific regulations on derivatives on collateralized bond obligations. So I think we've actually taken a very big step forward. Was it perfect? No. We'll keep working on it the way we always do in this country. But it was an important step forward for American families and for the stability of our economy. And, and Jim and I do differ on this point. Having unelected regulators write these regulations have worked out really, really well for us in the last 60 years. If congressmen don't understand what these regulations are, that's a problem. 
When congressmen are saying, oh, I'm not reading the bills, it's too complex, it's too long, that's a problem. We should demand more from our congressmen. We should say, you need to take responsibility for understanding these issues. You have big staffs. Learn these issues and do it. Don't delegate it. We have had a Congress, and it's been both parties, that delegate things because they're hard. Congress needs to start taking responsibility, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, and actually do the job that we've sent there to do. Read the bills. Understand regulation if you don't understand it. This is what we should demand from our Congress. Dan, I, I do read the bills. I read the health care bill twice, and I helped write the Wall Street Reform Bill, which involved reading it a number of times. Um, you said 60 years, how has that worked out? I, I want to talk about that for one minute. In the mid-1930s, in the wake of another economic catastrophe, like the one that we're living through and emerging from now, uh, FDR and the Congress at the time revamped our regulation, created the SEC, put in place regulation. We've seen this movie before. At the time, this was the end of the capitalist system, this was anti-market, this was Bolshevik, you name it. What we saw instead from 1930 until about 1980 was the single highest and largest period of economic growth the world had ever seen. It was not the death of capitalism. It was not overweening regulation. American families had faith in the system. This is what we have tried to do. When did it start to come apart? And this is not a Republican-Democratic thing. I hold George Bush and Bill Clinton equally accountable. Starting in about the mid-80s, we started pulling back. We did away with Glass-Steagall. We said that banks could get into uh, principal debts, they could get into real estate, and we have paid the price. All right, next question. Um, Jim, you're the first to respond. <clears throat> Excuse me, do you support the repeal of don't ask, don't tell in terms of gays in the military? Absolutely and unequivocally. This is a core American issue that we would tell a young man or a young woman who wants to give her life to protect us that you can't serve because we don't live, agree with your lifestyle is utterly inconsistent with who this country is. Fully agree. Anybody who wants to serve in our military, gay, straight, black, white, man or woman, you are a hero. Period. And don't ask them to tell us discriminatory, you should be removed. Right, next question. Um... <laughs> <laughs> equity in education. 
I just might add to that, in general, your views on the role of the federal government in education. Um, I like the way the questioner framed that question as it being the civil rights issue of our era. Uh, we aspire in this country to equality of opportunity of the American dream being available to everybody. But everyone in this room knows that if you're born to wealthy parents in Wilton, Connecticut, you probably don't have quite the crack uh, at, the, at the at prosperity that uh, uh, a child born into poverty in Bridgeport has. And of course, education is what makes the difference. Uh, as a guy who went to public school and who still believes that every door that has been opened to me is uh, attributable to a good public school, and as a guy with two little girls in the public schools, I think that there is probably nothing more better we can do to assure the future prosperity of this country and of our economy than making sure that every kid gets the very best education he or she can get. We've got a long way to go in places like Bridgeport in particular, where half the kids who walk in the door as freshmen not graduate. That is a moral blot on this country and economically a terrible thing. Uh, we know what works uh, and it is being modeled by charter schools around the country. It is also being modeled by reform in some of our public systems that are producing results related to good uh, principals, top-ranked, accountable teachers, longer time uh, in school, what the federal government can do is it can say exactly what this administration said with race to the top, which is if you do those things that we know lead to improvement and that, that allow reform to occur, we will provide the resources. Uh, it was terribly disappointing, of course, that Connecticut did not qualify for race to the top funds, but Hartford did make some changes that will improve our system of education uh, around the uh, around the state. Um, you know, Dan has uh, criticized aggressively the Recovery Act, and he has criticized my vote on a bill that provided some temporary money for teachers. I will defend those hard. Uh, this district received $50 million in recovery funds. Had that money not come in, your classrooms would have been much more crowded, or your property taxes would have gone up. That was an effect of the Recovery Act. Dan Lampoon's as useless pork barrel spending. I also voted for a bill that temporarily allowed 1,500 teachers in the state of Connecticut to not be fired. Because while I am concerned about the fiscal situation, I know that the future of our prosperity cannot tolerate 40 children in the classroom. Well, so to address that before I address the question itself is, you know, the Recovery Act, if you go to recovery.gov, created 800 jobs in Fairfield County. And all of those jobs will go away because they are either in construction or public employee jobs when the money runs out because the money's not going to be there anymore. The cost of those 800 jobs, according to recovery.gov, $230,000 per job. Government's not very good at creating jobs. By the way, the cost to your family, $10,000 more than national debt. So I'll leave it to you to decide if you think the things that you're miscounting is worth $10,000 more debt to your family. Now on education, this is actually an area where I think President Obama has gotten it right a lot more than President Bush did. Is if you actually look at No Child Left Behind, it started with the best of intentions, keep teachers accountable. But its fatal flaw was that it took a one-size-fits-all approach to education and mandated it. So because of that, we now have testing every year, teachers teaching to the test. It's not the right thing to do. We're distracting teachers from critical thinking skills. So race to the top is a much better way because in business, we always talk about best practices. Find the best practices and apply them to your company. That's what race to the top does for schools. It finds the best practices. It doesn't force you to do it. It says if you do it, we're going to give you more money. And I was proud to be a co-sponsor of the bill that you cited to actually move Connecticut in the right direction. Now let's be specific here for a second. What do our public schools need to do, especially our inner city public schools? Because Jim said it quite right. Most of our suburban schools in Fairfield County are good. They have, all of them have some issues, but they're generally of very good quality. How do we actually help our inner city schools? It's by adopting those lessons of charter schools that we've seen work I went to Achievement First in Bridgeport to pay a visit. And I gotta tell you, what I saw was amazing. Is six graders doing advanced critical thinking skills. 
all at both two classes doing very, very different things. And these were kids who were coming from families that don't have the, the advantages that folks in a Greenwich Row building have. But they were spectacular. Now, how did they do that? Well, there are a couple things. One is they pay their good teachers more, and they fire their bad teachers. Our public schools need to do the exact same thing. But things that nobody ever talks about, like curriculum flexibility. You know, our problem in our public schools is we say, hey, you know what, it's week 26, here's what you should be teaching. In the charter schools, they say, here's where the kids have to get to by the end of the year. You, the teacher, you decide how to get there. You pick the textbook. You make the specific lesson plan. Because as any teacher will tell you, any group of 30 kids is different than the next group of 30. So there are very specific ideas that will actually help our urban education actually reduce that education gap, which is real out there, and help make sure that we are not losing a generation of kids because we have failing schools. If, if I can quote the Hartford Current again, Mr. Debicella has been troublingly loose with the facts, and no, in no area has he been quite so loose and hypocritical as he has with respect to the Recovery Act. If you look it up, economists will tell you that some 38,000 jobs have been saved or created in the state of Connecticut, both directly and indirectly as a result of the economic effects of the Recovery Act. Is that enough? Of course it's not. But it was part of getting us to where we are today, where the economy is now growing, and where after losing 750,000 jobs a month when I went to Washington, we are now adding jobs in the private sector for nine straight months. Let me say that again. We are adding jobs in the private sector nine straight months. 900,000 total. That's not enough, but that's more than were created in the entire eight years of the Bush administration. Economists will tell you that there's two or three million people working in this country as a result of the Recovery Act. It's not something that we want to do, but it's something that helped turn us away from what was potentially a depression. Turns out, one of the biggest champions when he's not running for office of the Recovery Act was Dan DiBasella, because as the money came in, he sent out press release after press release, reading things like, in March of 2009, Debicella hails crime prevention grants for local communities. This is excellent news for Shelton. July of 2009, Debicella harkens stimulus funds to benefit Franklin Elementary School. September of 2009, Senator Debicella announces public safety stimulus grant. Town benefits from federal stimulus funding. March 2000, it goes on and on and on. So, Jim likes to play a very loose with the facts because he's learned that delicate art in Washington telling you a statistic that's true, but not telling you the, what, uh, what's underneath it. Right? So he says 38,000 jobs have been created, 800 have been created, or saved, excuse me, 800 have been private sector jobs that have been created. The rest have been union jobs, largely government unions. Where did all the stimulus money go to? It went to Hartford, and Hartford used it quite inappropriately to balance the budget, the budget I voted against. So whose jobs did that save? Well, it saved the government bureaucrats working at the DEP. It saved the government bureaucrats who were working at the DOT. So if you're one of those government bureaucrats, Jim Heim saved your job, not once but twice. But if you're in the private sector, if you think that the stimulus helped you, if you feel like, geez, this did a great job, the economy's roaring again, vote for Jim Himes. He thinks this has worked. He just said he thinks the economy's making a great comeback. I disagree fundamentally. All this did was build up an unsustainable deficit for our children. Let me give you a statistic. From George Washington through to 2008, this country built up $9 trillion of debt. In the last 23 months that Jim Himes and Nancy Pelosi have been running the show, we've gotten an additional three trillion. It is unsustainable. Now, again, if you agree with all this, if you think the stimulus worked, if you think that level of debt is okay, Jim's up here and he's defending it. Me, of course, as the state senator, whenever anything came through my district, I announced it, but I would trade every single one of them back to repeal the stimulus, and if going back 20 months we could replace that with a pure payroll tax cut, that would have done more to spur private sector jobs than any of these bloated big government programs Jim promotes. You're getting a feel for the level of honesty up here. Dan DiBasella just said that I told all of you that I think the economy is making a great comeback. I don't think one of you heard me say that. I think you heard me say exactly what I did.
which is that it was the piece of it. But he is also trying to persuade you, and he said it himself, all of the money went to Hartford. Ladies and gentlemen, almost 40% of the Recovery Act was tax cuts for you and for all of us. 95% of Americans received, paid lower taxes in the year 2009 and 2010 than they had in a very long time. It's not all going to Hartford. And just if I can pick up on something, he says that the jobs will go away. Everybody in this room knows that the stimulus is designed to be temporary. That's the definition of a stimulus. And if you believe that teachers and policemen and firefighters are not real jobs, and that the people who teach my children somehow don't deserve the same kind of focus than the private sector jobs that are out there, if you are willing to sort of degrade them by lumping them into some amorphous category of bureaucrats, Dan himself is your man. It's an odd thing. Dan himself's dad was a police officer. His mother was a court reporter in a federal court. These are important jobs. And we weren't setting out to start a new Google. Government cannot do that. But we were trying to keep firefighters and policemen and teachers teaching and keeping us safe rather than collecting unemployment insurance that we all pay for. And, and folks, this is the difference. If you believe the stimulus worked, if you believe the level of debt we have is okay, if you agree with the health care bill and all the other things that we're talking about, if you think Washington's getting it right, Jim is articulating all the points of why he believes it's right. If you think there's a better way on all of these issues, then I think you've heard better solutions for me. And I think the question is about education. So, <laughs> we're a little off of you. Well, there were several questions on the issue of job creation and what the best ways are to do that. So I guess I would say to either of you, have anything that you'd like to add in that general area of job creation? Okay, I think so too. All right. Uh, next question, and Dan, you're the first to respond. How do you plan to support an immigration plan for our country that reflects the values of our heritage and the goals of our Declaration of Independence, and presumably balancing that against security needs? Immigration is one of the lifebloods of this country, and I thank God for it every day, not just because my family came over here in the 18th. But my wife's family came from Argentina. Uh, her first language at home was Spanish. And I think that immigration is something that is vital to this country. The problem we have is it's too hard to come to this country legally. My, my mother-in-law and father-in-law waited three years to come over here. And that's why we have so many, so much illegal immigration. You can't blame people for wanting to come to America and live a better life. America is one of the greatest countries in the world. So what do we have to do to fix this? Well, there are basically three things. First, we do have to secure our borders. It's a very tough job. The border is 1,200 miles long on the southern border and almost 3,000 miles long on the northern border. Very tough to do, but we have to secure it as best as we can. More importantly, secondly, we need to expand legal immigration by doing something that Chris Shays and I have talked about. Uh, Chris, Chris was an idea on borrowing from him because I think it's a good one. Is starting something new called a blue card that would be like a green card, but says, if you meet certain conditions, welcome to this country. What are those conditions? First, much like an H-1B visa right now, you have an employer who's sponsoring you, any employer. Second, if you're in this country, you pay all the taxes due to this country. And third, you actually obey all the laws of this country. Fourth, of course, you pass a background security check. All those things happen, then welcome. Welcome to our nation. And as long as you have a job, you're welcome to stay here. Once we actually have done that, and we have folks who are following a legal procedure to come here, we can crack down on illegal immigrants. And we can say, look, we've made it really easy to come here illegally. If you choose to come here illegally, we're going to deport you. And if you're a company that hires illegal immigrants, we're going to prosecute you. So if we actually make legal immigration easier for people who want to come here and live the American dream, I actually think we're going along solving the problem. And this is something where we moderates have to come together. Both of the extremes are wrong. The ones who want to just give amnesty to everybody are wrong, and the ones who want to kick everybody out are wrong. We actually need to come to a sensible solution that does embrace our history of being a culture of immigrants. I believe that this is one of the key areas where we can move this country forward to a more humane uh, and better 
society consistent with the values of the Declaration of Independence. First, we secure our borders. They're insecure. That's a, a national security issue as much as an immigration issue. Um, and bear in mind that about half the people who are here illegally are overstaying visas, not crawling across borders. Second, let's give employers the tools, good tools, ID cards, whatever, to know who is entitled to work, and then really come down on those who seek an advantage by hiring those who are illegal. Uh, there is no way, as long as that employment incentive exists, that walls of any height or enforcement of any intensity will keep people out. Third, and here is a difference, and I debated Crochet's on this issue, we do need to ask those who are here, 12 million, to register. We need to say to them that uh, we're going to look at their past and we're going to find those who are criminal or who are dangerous to our society and we need to get them out of the country. And then I would favor something a little different than the blue card, which, because the blue card, again, if you want to clarify this, when Crochet's talked about it, there was never any hope that people who held a blue card could apply for citizenship. That's, that, that's correct. You would, you, would, you would have no path to citizenship? The, the, the path that exists right now okay. is citizenship. So this is a difference. This is a difference here. I um, would say to people who are here illegally, register, um, keep your job, pay your taxes, stay out of trouble with the law, pay us a fine because you broke our laws and we are a nation of laws. Um, learn English. We can talk about what else is in that package of things they would commit to do. And then you get to stay. And then there is an earned path to citizenship where you get to get in line to apply for U.S. citizenship. Not ahead of those people who have done it even, uh, legally, but you get to apply behind those who have. Why? Number one, if you go to people who are here undocumented and say, we want you to register, but you're never going to have a chance to apply for citizenship, your compliance is going to be not what you want it to be. Secondly, and this brings us to the Declaration of Independence and the values about who we are. The concept segment of American society who is carrying a blue card in their pocket, to whom we say you will work your whole life here and be welcome, but you will never have the opportunity to apply for the privilege and honor of being a U.S. citizen, to me is inconsistent with who we are as a country and reminds me, frankly, of some of the uglier uh, signs of our history when we had Jim Crow and we said to people, you are second-rate America. And I James, do you have something to add? We're almost ready for the I just want to clarify Go something. I, I think I misspoke. There, was, yes. th there would not be an automatic path to citizenship with the blue card, but I think an optional one like you're describing, I think is a good thing. But I don't think everybody who comes to this country wants to be a citizen. So I think having an optional path is a good idea, but not an automatic one. Yeah. All right. And the time has come to move to closing statements. So time is so you can clear your stopwatches. You will each have two minutes. And the first with his closing statement is Jim Williams. Well, let me reiterate my thanks uh, to Kay, to the League of Women Voters, to our timers. And if I might just get dispensation here, we've had some ugly discussions. Not ugly, some, some Spirit. Spirit. discussions here. But I want to break a couple of rules here. Tonight is Dan DeBusel's birthday, so I'd like to ask for a round of applause. Though Dan tries to play crochets, 
he is nothing like Chris Shays on the environment, uh, on universal health care, which Chris Shays introduced into the Congress and Dan would repeal. Dan's ideas of tax cuts as a solution to everything, of uh, deregulation, are ideas that we have seen before and would take this country back. Let's keep moving forward together. I thank you for the honor of representing you the last two years and hope to have the chance to do so again. Thank you.